Well, many people think of the word productivity as a bit of a dirty word. They imagine a standover boss flogging them to try and make them work faster, or perhaps having to put in extra hours at the office and miss out on the good things in life. They're things that really give life a lot more meaning. But actually, in economic terms, productivity is a much more significant, important, and I would say somewhat nuanced topic. And to help me wrap my head around that is Professor Sinclair Davidson. Professor, thank you so much for joining us here on the Aussie Wire. Hello, how are you? Doing very well. Now, you are banging the drum of productivity. You're talking about productivity in the public space because you consider this to be a very, very important thing for us to understand, to measure, and to improve. For the layperson, what the hell is it? Productivity is the ability of human beings to do more with less. Now, as you said in your in your opening intro, um, so many people kind of think of productivity as wage slavery, or they kind of think they're going to be replaced by a machine. Um, but in actual fact, productivity allows us to lead the lives of leisure that we currently do. Um, if you kind of think of the, the human experience, um, 200 years ago, before the Great Enrichment, we actually lived, most people lived lives that were nasty, brutish, and poor. Mm. Um, whereas now we actually live very comfortable lives. And, and dare I say it, in a country like Australia, we're almost at the post-scarcity stage. We don't want for stuff or things. We actually want for time. Mm. We want to be able to fit more into our days, to consume more, to live happier, better lives. This is kind of where we're at now um, compared to where we were 200 years ago. And, and I know it's going to sound slightly controversial, but I have no doubt that each and every single person who is alive today is living a better life than they would have 200 years ago if they'd been born then. So productivity is actually a good thing. We should welcome it. We should try to get more productivity into our lives. Well, your comments there are buttressed by the Productivity Commission. This is a graph prepared by the Sydney Morning Herald back in 2022. The blue line there shows the amount of productivity. So this is what is being created per person, per day or per, per, per unit of, uh, of energy, so to speak, going in. That has multiplied by seven since the year 1900. So to buttress your point about, you know, in the last 200 years, well, just in the last 124 years, it is multiplied by more than seven. But at the same time, the number of hours being worked has actually declined. And this is what productivity means. It's not about uh, you working harder, working longer. It's about working better, smarter, more efficiently, sometimes with technology. Sinclair, would it be fair to say, let me let me try and summarize this and, and conceptualize this in a way that perhaps might, might help the layperson. Is it fair to say that if on average human beings each produce more than they consume, then on average the world gets richer. But if they consume more than they produce then on average, the world is then getting poorer over time. Is that fair? That is exactly correct. Um, that's what we call the Malthusian trap. So throughout most of human history, our ability to expand as a species to live the good life was constrained by our ability to produce food. Um, for most of human history, um, human beings have sort of been hunters, gatherers, for foragers, farmers. Uh, we've actually been trying to maximize our calorie intake to kind of live. Um, poor people in the past were skinny. Um, poor people in the past were malnourished. We don't actually have a skinny malnourishment problem in Australia today. Uh, to, to the contrary, we actually have people pro probably eat too much. They have too many pounds. Um, I'm guilty of this myself, as you can see, chubby <laughs> cheeks. Um, this is a sign of prosperity. Um, and all of this has come about because of human ingenuity. So our human capital, we have created the world in which we live in. We have produced technology. Labor saving technology is a, an astonishingly good thing mm. um, to the extent that we even joke about it. Um, you know, the, 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 the old joke, you know, you gave your wife a, uh, um, a vacuum cleaner for Christmas. Um, if you were to do that today, you would be in a lot of trouble. Um, but 50, 60 years ago, when a lot of women had to stay at home and spend a fair chunk of the day sweeping the house, mm. um, things like vacuum cleaners, irons, mix masters, all of these sorts of things have been astonishingly liberating mm. for humanity. It's allowed us to do a lot more. It's allowed us to mobilize the female workforce. People live the lives that they choose. So just simple things like that um, are actually showing how technology has changed our world, made it a better place, allowed us to live the better life. 
Well, it's interesting. I, I hadn't prepared this for this interview, but you reminded me of something. I don't have a reference to prove it to you, but it, you may be familiar with it already. It's my understanding that one of the single most empowering pieces of technology in terms of productivity, the one thing that you could change in somebody's life that would have the greatest impact on their ability to produce and provide is a bicycle. The step from being on foot to being on wheels is, uh, as I understand it, one of the most empowering things about you know, how much they can move, how far they can travel, how fast they can get there, how much they can take with them. Uh, and all of a sudden, their ability to produce and be productive just goes through the roof with what we would consider to be a child's toy. It's amazing to think how privileged we've actually yes. become. Absolutely, it's 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 the 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 improvement in human lives over the the last two hundred years since uh, what Deirdre McCluskey calls the Great Enrichment mm -hmm. um, has been absolutely astonishing. Uh, we live happier, fuller lives now than what we did before, and a lot of that is because of productivity increases. We've actually been able to enhance the ability of each and every single human to do more. Now that means we all live happily ever after, right? That's the end of the story, or or perhaps not quite, because you've uh, you've released a report here. I'm going to bring up your graph. Uh, you've got some concerns. Talk us through this graph, what we're looking at here. You've got some concerns about what this represents. So one of the challenges for, for me, at least, is despite the fact that I've just told you this wonderful story about how we're living better lives and what have you, mm. um, it's very easy to sabotage an economy. And we, to my mind, have been sabotaging our economy. So what I've done there is I've taken out a well-known proxy for productivity, which the ABS calculates, but I've recalculated from scratch, slightly different definitions, mm -hmm. but more or less the same story. What we've got there is gross value added, which is a measure of GDP. Now, there are different ways of calculating GDP, which in theory should be identical, mm -hmm. but in practice are not. What the ABS does is it works out each way of doing it and then averages it. Right. But what I've got here is gross value added, which is actually a measure of the goods and services produced in Australia. And I've divided that by the number of hours worked in the Australian economy. Now, both of these numbers are guesstimates. There's, you know, we can quibble and argue, are they 100% correct for that? They are not. But nonetheless, this is a fairly good measure. Mm. And what we've got there is um, the blue line is the total productivity for the Australian economy, which from uh, the mid 80s to uh, the last quarter. Um, and more or less, we can see it's been going up except for the last couple of years. Mm. Um, the red line is uh, market productivity. And the yellow line there is non-market productivity. Now, the yellow What's line there is the government sector. Ah, right. Oh, okay. So now, yes, now, mm. okay. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things to talk through there, but let's just start off by looking at the blue line. The blue line seems to be trending up very nicely until about 2004, mm. at which point it seems to break and move up less uh, um, quickly. Mm -hmm. um, that is the the third John Howard government. Right. Um the red line tracks the blue line fairly well, and the yellow line is completely unrelated. Now, a lot of people are going to start off by saying, gee, Sinclair, why are you claiming that the, the government sector or the non-market sector is more productive than the market sector? Isn't that sort of counterintuitive? Mm -hmm. And the answer is that the government sector tends to be measured by input prices and not output prices. And the wow. government sector, people working in the government sector very often have very good salaries. Can I, can I try and um, translate that into, into normie speak and, and understand it if I can? Yep. <clears throat> because so much of what the government does doesn't have a, a market price tag attached to it, we can't calculate the value based on the shelf price of the product. Therefore, we calculate the value based on what it costs to actually, or based on the amount of money being poured in, including these ridiculous six-figure salaries and long lunches and all of the other nonsense that goes on. That is correct. Right. Yes. So that is how you explain that sort of thing. Um, and so that doesn't actually worry me. The other argument that, that, that we need to think about the, 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 the non-market sector or the government sector um, is something called Baumol's cost disease. Um, so if you kind of think that a an orchestra 200 years ago needed 20 or 30 people to play music for half an hour. Mm -hmm. um, there's been no productivity improvement there because the same piece of music requires the same orchestra, sure. the same 20, 30 people playing for, for an hour. So there is an argument that in some uh, sectors of the economy, productivity is not easy to measure. Mm -hmm. But in the case of an orchestra, of course, now you've got DVD sales and all that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. But mm -hmm. nonetheless, uh, um, that figure doesn't worry me. And we can see from about the... 
um, the mid 1980s until about 2000, um, even though it's badly measured, what have you, uh, productivity in the non market sector is actually increasing as well. Mm. From about 2000 to about 2010 or so, it flatlines. And from 2000, the last 10, 14 years or so, um, it's kind of declined. Mm. So what we have seen is massive increases in productivity across the Australian economy as a whole. We've seen increases in market productivity across the whole. We've actually seen a decline in non-market productivity as you know um, 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 over the last 15 years or so. Mm. But that's not the whole story. The other part of the story is we've seen a massive expansion in government activity or the non-market economy over the last, well, 40 years in total. Mm. Um, so in 1980s, the non-market sector of the economy made up about 19% of the economy. Um, in the last quarter, September of last year, it made up nearly 30% of the economy. And most of that growth has occurred in the last 20 years. So not only has productivity in the non-market sector or the government sector declined, mm. the size of the non-market and government sector has increased. So therefore, as its impact on the overall productivity of Australia is getting larger as its proportion of the overall economy also gets larger. It's getting much, much larger. Now, but again... The story gets worse. Okay. Sorry to uh, it's, uh, no. the story gets worse again because yeah. not only is the government expanding its sector of the economy, it's also imposing rules and regulations on the market economy, mm. which undermines uh, um, productivity in the market economy. Those productivity drags are not included in my graph here because you can't measure those the way I've measured this. So this is the best case scenario that we've got: um, the productivity drag being caused by government and the expansion of the non-market economy in Australia is worse than what this picture is showing you. So the, what is this downtick right at the end here? Is this just COVID or is this an indication that perhaps we've entered a new economic epoch? I think we've entered a new economic epoch um, because that downtick takes place in 2001. So that downtick is occurring after the COVID crisis, which is we, we can say is 2000, 2001, mm. after that has ended. Now, the argument that I make for that really is is that the the lockdowns broke the economy. Mm. Um, it's all very well saying, you know, we've got more people employed and all this sort of stuff. But in actual fact, there are a lot of businesses that have never recovered. Uh, we are actually seeing situations where, despite the fact that Australia has a massive housing shortage, we've got builders going out of business. Sure. Um, you know, how, how do you square that? Mm. Um, so the 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 political response to the COVID crisis actually imposed huge economic costs upon Australia. And that's what we're seeing now. The other thing that that, that we're also seeing is that a, a very nice handy measure of individual welfare um, is actually falling. So that is, um, <clears throat> just got to get it right, yeah. real gross household disposable income per capita. Um, that is a measure okay. of household wealth, um, in a on a, an inflation adjusted basis, and you divide it by the population size, that number has fallen dramatically as well. Mm. And contrary to what a lot of your what, uh, uh, viewers are going to claim, that is not because of the increase in population. Um, that has occurred despite the increase in population. So we actually have a a profound economic problem in Australia. Is mm. that our productivity numbers? are not as good as they should be. The growth in productivity over time is not as good as it should be. The government size is far too big and is now creating a productivity drag on the Australian economy. Mm. And we're coming out of an astonishingly economically irresponsible political response mm. to COVID. Um, we actually do need to do a little bit more than bully the supermarkets and cut people's mm -hmm. tax cuts. You know, it, it, it's, you know, I, I don't think the government is quite serious about what needs to be done. Mm. And at the same time, this is not a criticism of just the current government. Um, we see these trends having emerged during the Howard government. Yeah. Um, so these are long-term problems that actually just haven't been looked at, haven't been considered. Mm. Well, it's interesting you raised the point about population. Of course, GDP is a, is a measure that I've criticised numerous times here on the Aussie Wire. Uh, it's, it's a little bit like democracy, according to... Um, 
according to uh, wartime Prime Minister of England. Churchill. Was, Churchill, thank you, um, that it's the worst system of government with the exception of all of the others. Um, it's it's a little <laughs> bit like that for me with GDP. Yeah. It's the worst way of measuring an economy with the exception of all of the others. And one of the flaws in it is that politicians have this cheats way of increasing the GDP, and that is to add more people. But a much more real-world measure yes. that actually much more accurately reflects our lived experiences is to understand the GDP or, or more specifically the productivity uh, per person or per unit of, uh, of input. That's a much more significant measure as, as regards our quality of life. Look, Professor, this is, that's yes. all we have time for. I really appreciate you breaking that down for us, helping us to understand the problem. And I look forward to having you back on the Aussie Wire in future to uh, help us understand some of the solutions. Well, thank you for having me again. It's been great fun as always.